ready to get started here. Um, are my lights on? I think so. Um, that light is so <laughs> right. Uh, well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I don't have anyone to introduce me formally, so uh, my name is Nicole Morey. If you don't know me, I am a professor here in the print media area. Um, I see a lot of my students. I see some students from Cape College. I see some friends and colleagues and you know others. So thank you all for making some time. Um, there are some cards on the table if you're interested. Some announcement cards because I have a show downstairs in the Kerr Gallery right now that opened a couple weeks ago, but the reception for it is actually tomorrow. So if you're around between five and eight, you can stop by and see the work in person if you haven't already. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me just get started here. Um, all right, I gotta, boom, all right. Um, let me know if you can hear me because I have this voice thing and my voice has already been taxed from teaching for six hours today. So if it starts to get crazy towards the end of the talk, um, you'll know why. And if I start coughing, I promise I'm not contagious. I don't have any viruses. Um, it's just that my throat gets really irritated. My students have heard me coughing, so they know. Um, but we'll do what we can do. Uh, we have two screens here because we're being recorded, so it has to do with that. I don't just really want, you know, to <laughs> that sort of stereoscopic situation going on with Colleen wherever she went. <laughs> um, so, you know, pick a screen, you know, and just look at that. Okay. Um, yeah, so like I said, the impetus for this talk has to do with the show that I have downstairs. And that show is the culmination of the past year that I spent on sabbatical, um, which is a wonderful perk that university mm -hmm. professors enjoy, um, in which every once in a while we get to complete a project, you know, in our own creative practice and not have to teach or be on committees and do all that other stuff so we can just focus all our time and energy into our work, which, um, you know, teaching is a lot of work. It's, I love it, I enjoy it, but man, it's very hard, as all of you who have jobs know and are in school and have all these other responsibilities that trying to be creative after an eight hour, 10 hour day, or when you have one or two hours, or one or two days during the week, to switch it on at those moments can be kind of difficult. So the sabbatical is really a luxury that you know I appreciate uh, fully. Um, okay, so I should look at my notes a little bit here. Um, so the what I'm going to talk about is Lee is led up to. Okay, I don't want to say it. it <laughs> is about the work in the gallery, but first I have to take a few steps back and talk a little bit more broadly about some of the work that fed into this work, just to give it some context. So um, that's what I'm gonna do. All right, uh, this is one of the pieces from the show downstairs, just so you can get a little sense up close of what you're gonna be looking at. Um, I think that it's a pretty good representative piece from that show. And what I want to say about my work as an artist, my kind of artistic practice, is that you know my work has sort of evolved slowly over time, but it's always come from the same place. You know, some people explore a lot of different things in their work, and you know, while I do go on tangents, my work has really been developing out of ideas of um, home and history and identity, I mean, since I was an undergrad. So for a long time, um, I've been exploring that, looking at it from a different angle, changing the medium and the media and the strategies that I approach that work with, but um, it's all very kind of autobiographical for me. So, looks even better with two of these now. Um, <laughs> so this show downstairs is, is called In Its Place, and it's, the work in it is based on the fact that 
Um, in my life up to this point, I've lived in 24 different homes. And a lot of those were when I was a kid. So there was a lot of moving around when I was very, very young, in those kind of formative years. And that has really affected um, you know, me personally, my, uh, my own character, but also the, you know, the artwork that I make, it's infiltrated it up to this day. And so this is sort of a list of all those places that I've lived. Um, I'm from Iowa originally, so there's a lot of them in Dubuque, which is the town that I grew up in partially. And I lived in South Carolina and Chicago and Iowa City and here in Kalamazoo. So, I mean, I know a lot of people have lived in a lot of places, and so they can probably relate to the work to some extent. I don't think I am by any means the only person who's you know, moved around a lot, but um, I think for me, because I was such a shy kid, that it really, you know, I think when you're, when you move, you have to take on either one of two per personas, right? You have to be like kind of shy and invisible so that nobody notices that you're new um, and makes fun of you, or you have to be really outgoing, and um, that wasn't my nature. So I was in camp sort of number one. Um, and because of all of those constant interruptions, uh, you know, my own sense of my own personal history, how I see myself, the memories I have, they're really incomplete and really inconsistent. And um, there's a lot of gaps in my history because both of my parents are gone now. So I don't have, uh, you know, anyone to really go in and ask, like, what was that? carpet in that house, you know, that we lived in. What do you remember what that looked like? Or, you know, why was I here at some point in time? So I, you know, the artwork is sort of looking to fill in those gaps that I don't have family that can fill in for me. You know, all those kind of missing pieces. Um, so going way, way, way back, uh, when I was moving around a lot, in order to sort of cope with that, you know, I definitely latched on to school as my kind of safe space, as, a, as an area of comfort. Um, as you can see, you know, just some example images at the sort of things that I was really attracted to in school. A lot of things that had to do with repetition and memorization and perfection, right? Learning to write, uh, do handwriting and cursive, which people don't have to do anymore. <laughs> um, learning how to spell and all the meanings of the words and uh, just being sort of surrounded by this really factual information that you're inundated with when you're in school. So that, that made a lot of sense to me. Um, and of course, because of that, I keep touching the mouse, I don't need to. Uh, it wormed its way into my work as well. So uh, this goes way back to grad school, 2004, right, you know, pretty early in my art career, but basically right before I came to Western. Um, and so one of these projects that I did when I was in grad school was a screen print series called How I Learned My ABCs. And um, there's, you know, of course, one letter for every, uh, or one print for every letter in the alphabet. And they were based on that kind of discrepancy between the way I was taught the world worked in school, which was very systematic, very clear, kind of laid out, there was right, there was wrong. Um, and then how I was learning that the world worked at home, which was you know, not the most functional <laughs> place in the world, plus there was the moving all the time. So those two ways of the world were really contradicting each other. And this, you know, this, uh, project explored that, trying to emulate some of those kind of primer posters that you would see in, in you know, elementary school. Um, and just for my print students, you know, um, for the print nerds, these are screen printed, they're all hand done. Uh, some of them are anywhere between 12 and 20 colors, reductive prints, so, you know, that's what they are. They're about 18 by 24, so to reference that kind of typical poster size. And
And this was another project that I did in grad school, kind of concurrent with that ABC project, which was also dealing with the alphabet and language and, you know, um, assigning meaning and definition to things. So for this, it was actually an interactive project. Um, all of these prints just had, you know, the printed type, R is for routine, whatever, and a blank page. And so I invited the audience to come in and add their own words to it. Um, and these are the same words that are printed that were on the ABC posters, or on the ABC prints. And so, you know, I really, I had this whole setup. I had this small gallery. I had them all on the wall. I had these beautiful little pencils hung from a string with each one. I had a nice little pedestal in the middle with a dictionary, you know, a post, like a sign on the wall that said exactly how to interact with the word. You know, in my mind, it was perfection. <laughs> and then, you know, the idea was that each, each person added a word um, that kind of followed the rules of, of the poster. And of course, people did what they wanted. You know, they, they drew a lot of graphic pictures. <laughs> um, of course, you know, there were some other, not graphic, but drawings in there. They spelled things. They, you know, God forbid, they wrote between the lines, along the lines. Um, some of them, not in these two examples, but drawing the borders, you know. And I remember being really like, angry at this um, Like, because I, like, I told it, and I just was like, there's a sign. Like, that's how you do it. They, I found it like a personal affront that they had personally offended me by not doing it the way I wanted. And I mean, you know, I was in grad school, and after I had a minute to kind of step back from it, I realized it was ridiculous for me to impose onto other people, like, you know, these expectations. Like, I was mirroring the kind of institution that uh, I grew up in, right? Like, you do it this way, or you get an F, you know, you do it the right way, you get an A. Um, but in the end, so I really did start to embrace it. It's funny, like, I love that someone went through with all of the prints and a red marker and corrected all the errors. Like, that, like after I got over the rage, like that made me really happy. Um, and I respect them now. I've grown and matured, so. Um, yeah, so anyways, that was an interesting project. Um, you know, now I'm gonna jump forward a good 10 years. Um, I'm not going to show you my whole, you know, early work. Uh, I just wanted to show you some of those early examples because I did eventually come back to language as an important part of my practice, and I created this. I always call it the dictionary project, but um, the official title is by definition. And what I did was I was I was sort of thinking about well, at the time I was collecting all of this printed matter, this kind of informational-based printed matter, like dictionaries and ledgers and scientific diagrams and maps and blueprints, all of this kind of stuff, and using them in these collages. Um, so I was sort of already surrounded by that, surrounded by that sort of information. But I found myself coming back to the dictionary over and over again. Um, and I think, I think that, you know, when I was a kid, I was one of those kids that would just open the dictionary for no reason, you know, back when we had those books in our houses, and I would just, you know, flip through the pages to see if I knew the word or not, you know, and if I did, I felt all warm and fuzzy inside, and if I didn't, I tried to learn it so that I could feel warm and fuzzy next time, you know. Um, so I was assigning my, like, worth to this, you know, this kind of memorized, sort of useless knowledge in some ways. Um, so what I ended up doing was sitting down with the 2014 like unabridged Webster's Dictionary and going through and um, noting what words I knew. This is, you know, at this point I'm in my whatevers. And <laughs> what I didn't know, right? So I made two lists. And then of course, 
the What I Don't Know book, because I put them into two separate volumes and made these artist books out of them, the What I Don't Know is much thicker than what I did know. Um, you can't really see it in that image, but that's the I Don't Know. And so, yeah, so there's two volumes, which you can see, oh, here it is. You can't really read the title page, but um, this volume contains words that I know something from <laughs> the Webster unabridged second edition dictionary sort of thing. Um, and you can kind of see how the pages are laid out. Um, and so it was a long project. A lot of my projects will take a year or years to actually complete. So, um, you know, part of my working strategies as an artist is that repetition, is that kind of comfort in doing something over and over and over again. And in a project like this where I could just sit down and it was a very kind of black and white task, um, satisfied me. And I think it sort of, um, I don't know, I think that the idea was in the end, I mean, I, I could have discovered this through therapy, but um, you know, it didn't matter what I knew. We are not defined by how many useless facts we know or what we do or don't know and whether we can spell a word correctly or not. But I had just sort of brain my, brainwashed myself to think those things were really, really important. So I wanted this as a way to kind of like slap myself out of it. Um, and it sort of worked. I guess. Um, but I had someone build these really beautiful pedestals for me who used to uh, run the wood shop here and the School of Art. And I had, I mean, I got to work with all these other kind of people. I had um, one of the graphic design students help me lay out the book. I had uh, a book binder somewhere in Vicksburg, I think he was based, who actually, you know, made the books for me. So it was really the first time that I got to experience having things fabricated for me that I didn't actually make myself. And that was kind of an interesting experience, a sort of new experience at the time. Um, and I felt a little guilty about it, but now I would not have a second of guilt. So, all right. And this is another sort of dictionary-based piece called Abridged, you know, unabridged meaning like the full long version of the dictionary, abridged meaning abbreviated. And then um, this relates to the stuff I was collaging that I talked about before. So this is what I was sort of doing um, before I did the dictionary pieces. And what I was doing is I was cutting out all the images from the dictionary, all the, you know, engravings essentially. Um, physically removing them and then cutting them into smaller parts and then collaging them onto these uh, pieces of paper that had grids printed on them. Um, I mean, you can see the close-up here. And that was a really satisfying process for me as someone, you know, gluing them down individually and sort of trying to figure out where they go and not sneeze and like blow all the little pieces everywhere. Um, I did feel some guilt about cutting up books because, you know, I was always kind of a, a reader. And so I, there was like a moment of guilt, but I figured since it was in service to the art, you know, um, I could live with that guilt. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so this kind of goes back to those ideas of education um, and of authority. You know, the idea that what's in a book is true and truthful and should not be um, contended with, you know, that it should be accepted. And so I was kind of rewriting those narratives for myself. Um, other projects that I was doing after that were really influenced by other ways that we learn, particularly as children, you know, how to interact with our own creativity. And so I was looking at a lot of paint by number kinds of images and a lot of coloring books. Um, because again, there's that kind of right and wrong way to approach those images, right? And 
yes, you're given a pencil when you're like two or three years old and maybe a blank piece of paper, but I'm too young to even remember that. What I do remember is, you know, being obsessed with coloring inside the lines and getting like the perfect flat value and you know, all that stuff that just like, oh, poor little Nicole, you know, like she could have done so many other things with her time. But, um, but I was, you know, I loved it. And so those things just made me start questioning that, right? And as an educator, I still question the way we teach, you know, our students to express themselves. I struggle with it still. Um, so out of those, kind of out of that research into those sort of materials, I created this piece in 2014 called By the Numbers, Buying Road. And I had made some other kind of paint by number inspired pieces before this, but they all responded to existing paint by numbers made by other people, like found at thrift stores and things like that, that I just sort of aesthetically gravitated towards. But this was the first time that I had used my own imagery to deconstruct. And so, um, and I have a process image coming up to show you so you can kind of see that progression. But uh, each one of these panels are 18 by 24, so it's a pretty large piece. It's about 12 feet wide by about six feet tall. Um, and this was actually installed as part of my uh, sabbatical show in 2014. So, you know, it's been a minute since I've had one of those. And um, the images, so I took this image of a farmhouse that my parents lived in for a brief amount of time, uh, but that was very formative for me for a variety of reasons. And I deconstructed, well, I guess I'll just show you. Alright, so farmhouse, exhibit A, the photograph, and so then I essentially tried to create my own paint by number drawing based on that photograph, um, and then I took that hand drawing and I brought it into the computer and I assigned the colors where I thought they should, you know, I came up with a 20 color palette or whatever it was, and assigned those colors, and then I, the beauty of, you know, working digitally, and this was probably one of the first times I really worked digitally. Um, I was always kind of an avid hand by hand person, but I started to use the computer a little bit more and more um, to save myself some time. And so I was able to, you hear my voice going, uh, <laughs> I was able to deconstruct all the layers and separate them and lay them out. And eventually I turned them all black and I hand painted them onto um, like uh, white painted acrylic masonite. And then when I framed them, I put a piece of just slightly frosted plexiglass in front of them so that it kind of causes them to be a little blurry, a little fuzzy when you look at them. So it's not just a bad photograph that I took. Um, you know, to kind of push them back, to give them a bit of a ghostly feel. Um, Yeah. All right. Uh, this is maybe a little more indicative of the work I was doing. I guess we're going back another 10 years, but this was indicative of what I was doing when I came out of grad school. Um, and I just show it because it still relies on a lot of those systems of the grid and about organization and organizing spaces. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm not so much of a drawer as just like a rearranger. Um, <laughs> You know, like all of these objects, it wasn't so much about how they were drawn, but where they were placed. And I have a lot of these kind of prints in this series. Well, they're kind of a combination of drawings and prints that, um, you know, where there are different relationships between the objects. And they were all kind of disguising some familial relationships and struggles there. Um, these sort of feelings of otherness I grew up with. But yeah, so you know, staying inside the lines directly, kind of referencing the coloring book, and then all evidence suggests otherwise. Uh, you know, just this idea of kind of repetition and the grid and the kind of you can't see it very well, but there are these numbers where I'm counting everything. So I started to make a lot of work where I would count things. Um, yeah, there's some numbers at the top of that one as well.
So this is the last piece that is from, that I'll show that comes before the work downstairs in the show, and then I'll talk about that work. Um, this piece was done in 2019, actually right before uh, COVID started. <laughs> And it's a piece called Translated. It's a little hard. It's hard to photograph and it's hard to see here, but I have some details. But I wanted to give you kind of the full effect. So each of these panels is like, I can't remember, like 14 by 18 or something like that. They're, they're you know, small, like notebook paper size, but a little bit bigger. Um, so again, it's kind of a large installed piece. And then here's a couple of details. Um, and so all of these are based on places that I've lived. So I was starting with uh, floor plans, essentially, of the houses that I lived in, but all drawn from memory. Because, you know, where am I going to find a floor plan from some rental in Dubuque, Iowa, from like, you know, 1987. So, um, so yeah, so again, there's like a whole process to get to these images that my work tends to rely really heavily on. So it's not just about the final product, it's about all those stages that go into um, kind of making it along the way. So the image on the left is kind of the, the floor plan that I, you know, drew and just used Illustrator. And then I took all the vector points, and those people who know Illustrator know what I'm talking about, just the little, you know, points that define your shape. Um, and I removed the shape and left the vectors, and then I started to space them out more evenly and connect them with lines. And I started to like the way that it reminded me of, of like language, of like Morse code, of some kind of you know, coded message or even braille, you know, all these sort of attachments to language and that idea of translation between your memories, which are never accurate and, you know, um, well, that translation that happens from the original event to the memories when you remember them, when you bring them up. So that's what that piece was sort of interested in. Uh, so now we go back to the present, <laughs> um, to the work downstairs. I didn't bring my throat cool. Um, because I feel like um, when I talk about my work, like I said, it's evolved in a very almost linear kind of fashion. It's very straightforward in some ways, looking at the influences and the order of events. And I wanted to interject something else for a moment um, to communicate something else about the work that's not in the same way. Um, so bear with me for just a moment. We're going to have a little interlude. Um, and you can feel free to close your eyes. I'm going to recite something, and you can take it in, or you can keep a moment, I don't care, that's up to you. Um, if you've been downstairs to my show, this is part of the first part of my artist statement on the wall, so maybe you're familiar with it. Um, it's not going to sound as pretty with my voice the way it is, but I'll do my best. All right. A steep hill, blue-flowered linoleum, a broken rabbit hutch, the impossibly blue sky after the hurricane, homemade birthday cakes and tarnished sheet pans, my sister's foot in the doorway, dark wood paneling and duct taped keyholes, salmon colored roses, desserts cooling on the porch, Elvis on the top shelf, sitting on the back steps while my brother cries, watching the orange drip van drive away, noises from the street below, brown shag carpet that never felt clean, a dark green couch too rough to sleep on, my dad's dresser, the sound of plastic on the windows in winter, unwanted feelings of deja vu, a cordless phone tonight, standing in the closet talking to my mom for the last time, a crow's head in the backyard, 
Christmas lights in the maple tree, difficult conversations, woods that make me feel invisible. Interlude over, you may open your eyes. Um, so for me, that sort of just conjures up something more emotional. You know, it's all of these memories strung together, the good and the bad. Um, and I know it means something very different for me than it does for you because you weren't there. Um, but we all have these kind of memories and we put them together and, you know, they're just disjointed, but at the same time they kind of make up this whole so it makes me feel like I do have more of a history than I think I do sometimes. Okay, so a few other examples of the work downstairs in the show. Um, so all of these, just like a lot of the work that I've done, each one is based on a place that I've lived. And they're, the series is called In Its Place. And the titles are based on the street name. So it's in its place, Gilbert Street, Kedzie Boulevard, Highway 20, Logan Boulevard, Pulaski Road, Chicago Avenue. Um, and this is just kind of a random assortment. They're not really in any particular order. Um, but you can kind of see those. And there's a process course behind these as well that I'll give you a little sneak peek into. And if you're interested in this process, there is a book down in the gallery that I made because I had shown a portion of this work back in February in Chicago, but I hadn't completed all the prints, so I made this book to sort of show, first of all, the whole series of prints because I hadn't digitally done it. I just didn't have the physical screen prints made yet. And so that um, you know, the viewer could kind of get a window into the process of how they were made. And so this is similar to what's in the book downstairs, not exactly the same, but you can see that I'm starting with photographs, many of which I've taken, but there were a few places that um, I couldn't take those photographs. So I had to use Google Maps for one or two, uh, for, you know, a few of them down in South Carolina because I couldn't get there. Um, but, you know, they were then, just like the uh, paid by number farmhouse piece, you know, they were turned into these kind of paint by number referential drawings, and then they were taken into uh, Illustrator and Image Traced, and all the different pieces that made them up were kind of broken up and reconfigured, you know, so they came this kind of chaotic, um, massive shapes, and then they were reorganized, so again, that rearranging, you know, impetus, um, into these compositions, and, you know, it took a while to be able to make compositions where I used all the pieces, so that it just took a long time to do each one, um, but once I had them digitally, as much as I liked the work, I wanted some kind of physical element to it, so I decided to make them screen prints, to actually print them by hand. And so I did that using you know, my studio at Park Trades, but also the school's facilities to some extent over the summer and breaks when students weren't around. I could spread out, which was great. Um, me in action. <laughs> you know, and, and they're not huge. I mean, they're 24 by 24 framed, essentially. So they're not giant images. But as my students know, the, when you start to print kind of large, it, it's a physical challenge. I was tired every time I printed, uh, way more tired than I was in my 20s and my 30s. <laughs> um, but so I wanted them to have that kind of connection to my body. You know, I wanted, a lot of times my process becomes this kind of, I don't want to use the word therapeutic, but, um, there's a real connection between the fatigue of the actual activity, whether it's drawing a mark over and over and over again, or whatever it might be, um, that makes me in a way feel like I earned it, you know, um, that I kind of paid for the work. And so even though I spent, you know, 20 hours in front of the computer for every single of the 24 images, that didn't feel 
it just didn't feel done to me. So that's why you know I went that direction. Um, and one last image. Um, also in the show are these wooden pieces that um, are sort of interspersed with that throughout the printed work, and they are these kind of wooden relief pieces. They're not really sculptures. They're not really, I don't know what they are. Um, I tend to work two-dimensional, so they're kind of, you know, one of the few forays that I've had into something that's not just completely flat. Um, but they came out of this process, like they weren't planned when I was kind of designing the show and designing the work initially. Um, what happened is I had this show in Chicago and I only had half of the prints, so I needed to fill some gallery space, you know. I, I didn't want it to feel too empty, and so I had been thinking about creating a separate edition of these prints as a portfolio in which I had all these um, shapes cut really small out of plexiglass, and I was going to emboss them into the, into the prints, you know, and I was going to emboss them in this way that's called blind embossing where it just looks like you know in like the shape is kind of emerging out of the paper it's really kind of ghostly and, and ephemeral and i find them really beautiful and i'm like well i could do that on the wall right i could cut these pieces out of wood and i ended up having them cnc routed by a place here in town called cal blue Reef graphics um and then I painted them and sanded them and all that business. And my partner helped me install hardware on the back so that they would um, hang flush to the wall. So that was a process. But I saw them as ultimately as like kind of individual memories. And the way our memories work where, you know, we'll think about something and it kind of floats to the surface of our you know, of our brain for a while and then it submerges back down and another one kind of floats to the surface. So I wanted them to feel like they were kind of emerging from the wall. So I found out the exact kind of paint that the gallery used and I painted them that same color to kind of replicate that embossed paper feel. Um, so when you go down there, you'll see some prints, you'll see some of that, you'll see the book. Um, there were some things that I was gonna do in there that didn't work out. You know, it's always a trial and error. But I like the direction they're going in and so I decided to end with this image just because it's something I think I'm going to be continuing to pursue and you might see something related to it in the faculty show next semester, so you know, we'll see. Um, so if you want to get a hold of me, you know, I'm on Instagram, um, I've got a website, there is a reception tomorrow night for the show, so you're welcome to come back and have some light refreshments and uh, look at the work in person and, you know, mingle and do all the things that people do at receptions. Um, so I hope to see, you know, every single one of you there. Um, <laughs> and we probably have time for a couple of questions. Um, if anybody wants to throw one out there. Yes, Emma. I thought it was really interesting how you talked about, like, European school a lot by the book. Yet at the same time, many people think of artists as people who like to think outside the box. So I guess like how did you realize that that's what you wanted to do, that you wanted to be an artist? Uh, that's a good question. Um, and I don't even, like some people you know, like they have these great stories, but I, you know, I just, I always drew um, because I was such a like isolated, introverted kid, so I spent a lot of time, you know, doing stuff that I could kind of sit and quietly do, and I enjoyed that. Um, and then I really didn't take many art classes in high school until I took one or two as a senior, and that was it. But I had my stepfather's stepfather <laughs> was a painter who was in my life for like ten years, and. He would let me and my cousins run around in the studio, and even though he made these kind of like abstract expressionist paintings, um, I just loved the like being in the studio and smelling the materials and you know riding around on a stool. And I just thought it was the best life. You know, he didn't have a job; he was just an artist. But he was <laughs>
big artist needs a job. <laughs> um, but he was like 70. He didn't do this until he retired, you know, so it wasn't like he was some 20 year old doing this. Um, but he was just so generous with his, with his time that I sort of thought, sure, you know, I can, I'll do that. And I, when I went to school, I started out in graphic design because I thought, like a lot of people do, like, I need to get a job and I need to do something that it translates into a job. And I did it for a few years. I really liked it. Um, and then, like this was the mid-90s, we got into the computer and I started to hate it. And I missed the hand. And I took a printmaking class. It was an Italian printmaking class. And I just... I loved the magic of pulling the print off the copper, and I just had all, you know, this pile of things. So the repetition and the process, like, it was just, like, calling me. And after that, I sort of didn't look back at the graphic design stuff, and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Thank you. <laughs> yes? I'm just curious how different the process was internally when you were making a piece about a house that you currently live in. Well, you mean like with the series downstairs, the actual yeah. one? Yeah. I think I, it's definitely different because there's far more positive associations <laughs> with it than, you know, a lot of the other places, but um, I still find myself like thinking, well, what's the next place gonna look like? You know, like this isn't the final place, it's just a way station and you know, even though I love where I live and, you know, I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 years, but I just, I don't, I've been in this house now for 12 years, which is, you know, most of the places it was like six months or a year or two years or three years or something, but um, I still, in some ways, could walk away, which seems terrible, but also it's kind of nice to think that my life isn't, like, that part of my life isn't fully decided, you know, that I can, there's, there's freedom in moving when it's your own choice versus when it's, you know, someone else telling you, you know what, we're going to, you know, you, you're in Iowa, let's go down to South Carolina for a few years, and they don't ask you, you know, so, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. I don't know what you're looking <laughs> How the, the Stewart Street house, which I recognize. Um, I'm just so curious. It's really great to, to see your process with that. And so you've got all these components, and then it seemed like you explode them out. And then how do you decide? You know, like a final composition. And then when I read them, I feel like the brain's always trying to make sense of what we're looking at. So I like that they both seem like maps from a distance, and then there seem to be symbols, but. How conscious is your process? Or what is that process of taking all these parts and then is it, oh, it looks finished, it looks good, or? or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I started this project, or a version of this project, maybe six or seven years ago, and I made them as relief things. Um, and I got like eight of them done, and then it was on hold for several years. So I, when I came back to it, I looked at how I had been constructing those images, and, and then the first set of them, um, it was very much about this orderliness, like taking every piece and finding a place for it and trying to evenly space out the space around it and just get them all in there. There, I wasn't thinking so much about relationships, um, and I can go back, but um, <laughs> so they were just kind of more evenly spaced out. So again, I was thinking about that idea of kind of in its place, which is where the title for the, you know, the series came from. But then as I got back into them, I really enjoyed more making relationships between the pieces. So, I mean, I was making these kind of, I was sort of grouping similar pieces that were alike, and I was, and some of them, um, there's almost, like there's one called Gilbert that almost to me looks like a landscape, you know, and so I started to more consciously construct these sort of spaces and, and parts of narratives and you know, relationships between the pieces that um, I hadn't been doing before, and I and I liked that a lot more. So I actually even went back and reworked a few of the earlier pieces um, to to put them more in that line. But um, you know, it's done when I was just tired of it. <laughs> I, everything fits. 
Um, you know, I spent hours like checking the spaces between every friggin' little object. Um, so I kind of hit a point where I couldn't work on it anymore. And you know, they're hard to stare at for a long time sometimes. But uh, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that you're putting together, but you don't have a box with the image on it. So you're just trying to put things together and. In the end, you can't really make an image, but you do the best that you can. Um, I don't know if that's really true, but, you know. So yeah, there wasn't like a clear, it's done. I hope they're done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some I go back and I like more than others, and I have my favorites, so, yeah. Did you have a question back there? Yeah. So, in the object drawing class, we're learning about negative and positive space. So, did you draw the negative space? Well, because they were these line-based drawings, I was drawing both the positive and the negative space. And then when I brought them into Illustrator, I basically filled them in so each shape was solid and I broke them apart. So the negative space didn't exist in the original. Like I sort of made it when I started to take all those pieces and arrange them into a, a new space. Um, so technically, the shapes are both kind of positive and negative. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? Do people get nasty? <laughs> what were you pointing at? <laughs> oh. <laughs> of the memories um, or the relationship that you have with the shapes. The shapes hold memories. The shapes are uh, metaphors, sometimes allegories for, for things. The title of the series is called In Its Place, which also makes me think of something that's like a surrogate or standing in for. Um, in all the work that, that I've seen you do, they're often very process-based work. You know, there's a real, uh, you, you decide a set of systems mm -hmm. or a, a set way in which you're going to create uh, the work. And then you're very rigid about that. Um, in this work, there seems to be more, a kind of more aperture about the way in which they're being placed together. So there seems to be um, just something shifting. In your in the way in which you're making work, is that true, or um, do you find that to be true? That is a good question. I mean, even though they don't maybe look as directly systematic as some of the other work, I mean, there was a set of rules that was sort of you know set up in the beginning, and occasionally I would have to break them and expand those rules, but. I have to think about that more, so I feel like I approached it in a somewhat similar way, but a lot of my past work has also been more about mark making, and these are more, like there's more recognizable imagery attached to them, so the shapes are certainly more loaded, you know, there's more meaning to them as I'm looking at them than a series of little, you know, more marks. Charged. I don't right. know, you know, if that's a motive or, or what, but... Well, and I think, you know, the black and white is kind of intense, too, so that definitely charges them a little bit, to use your word. But, yeah, thanks. Jacob. I think it becomes a kind of an interesting way to then think about how, um, kind of what you were talking about earlier, how like, all these memories and experiences are your own, and kind of showing us this kind of like abstract, fragmented version of it, then it becomes kind of like our perception. If you were to show us like a house, there's just like that much for us to really go on there. It's kind of an interesting way to kind of like portray that kind of perspective also kind of share that kind of point of view for yourself also. Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, I think that sometimes when we make work, we struggle with how much to divulge and how specific to get and, you know, 
what do I want to tell a stranger, essentially? And this is kind of a covert way of, I know what these things are, and there's little hints here and there, and the book kind of helps illuminate that a little bit, but I, you know, I can exist in them differently than you can exist with them, um, and I can kind of have my private narrative, but also open it up to other people, you know, um, who might feel a sense of chaos in their lives, or otherness, or whatever that might be. And that's kind of, again, that title, you know, In Its Places, a place for everything and everything in its place, right? And I just, when I was growing up, I didn't feel like I knew what my place was, you know, exactly. Because my parents were divorced and I had brothers here and sisters there. It was just like, I wasn't sure where I belonged. And so I always felt like I was kind of looking in from the outside a little bit. And, you know, that's where a lot of this comes from. Ginger? Oh, I I mean, it was definitely kind of a like a, you know a supplement to the work when it was shown in the gallery in Chicago because I didn't have the complete series. Um, you know, here in this show because all the work is there, it doesn't quite function the same. But you know, I put so much work into it and I liked it and I you know I still wanted to show it. But in that case, it's really more about um, that kind of window into the process, right? Um, and Ultimately, you go in that space and there's these like white indistinct forms and there's these, you know, chaotic black and white images that don't, that look very abstracted. And so the book has some photographic images in it that maybe can anchor the work a little bit, anchor the viewer's um, experience with the work, put it into a place instead of whatever this necklessness is. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Um, your poem that you read at the beginning um, was more vulnerable and gave more understanding about the feelings behind the art that you're making. What made you decide to include that? <laughs> well, it's funny because it was always a written thing. Um, and at this show I had in Chicago, which was back in February, there was a gallery talk, and so I had this audience there, and this older guy came up to me right like five minutes before I was about to talk. You know, I had this whole, I had notes, I had everything planned. Like, I didn't have a projector, so I was just talking about the work around me, but I had this whole plan, and he's like, you gotta read that. I'm like, mm, that's not really my thing. You know, like, I don't think of it as a poem, because I, I don't think I'm a good writer, and I never write like that. Like, I think of it as visuals more than almost words. And so it, did, it just never occurred to me to read something like that out loud. Um, and he just would not leave me alone. <laughs> you know, I'm just like 80, and I'm like, okay, I'll do it for you, I'll do it, you know. Um, and so I did, and I don't know, it's just I liked the rhythm of it, and I thought, like I said, it's sort of more vulnerable, and people seem to respond to it. So I, you know, it's still something so new. I Every time I feel a little outside my own body when I'm reading it. Like, it's still a little awkward for me to hear myself read it, but I do, um, I do like it. So I don't know, you know, maybe I'll, I'll try more of that, but I'm glad to hear that it works. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too jaw, like, you know, it's like I said, I'm talking and then I do that and then I go back to talking. I really never know where to put it. You know, like it, it's hard to, to put it at the beginning is one thing, but in a talk like this where I'm going back in time and talking about all this other work, it doesn't make as much sense. Like if I was only talking about this work, I'd probably put it at the start, but yeah, thanks. All right, everybody wants to get out of here. Well, thank you very, very much.